Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Tom Jensen. We're on location this week in Jamestown. My guest is Jason Smith. Jason is a big game biologist with Game and Fish. He's in charge of a moose study that's in progress, probably the second year of a two-year study. Jason, we did a story last year on the moose capture, and it's really fascinating how you guys go in, capture these huge animals, and put collars on them. Yeah, right. Well, basically, um, we're coming up on almost a full year now uh, with collared uh, cow moose on the air. And what we did is, our original capture, all live capture, live handling. Uh, we didn't drug the animals. Um, we contracted with a capture crew um, that uses a helicopter and net gunning. And basically, what we did is, um, my pilot and myself would go out and locate these animals in advance just to kind of reduce ferry time. And once we found them, we, we'd radio to the helicopter and they would come in and, you know, attempt to get an animal in a position where they were able to safely net gun it. Um, one of the things with moose is you don't want them running full speed when you're throwing a net over their head um, to just basically prevent them from coming down and, and injuring themselves. And they did a really good job at doing that. And so the capture crew was basically the pilot running the helicopter. Uh, the gunner and a mugger that was with them as well. Sometimes they had two muggers. Um, so they get the moose in position, get the net over her head, um, which was really interesting. The moose would generally, for the most part, if everything went well, would get tangled up in that net and then the helicopter would get low enough. It wouldn't land, but they'd get low enough for the muggers to jump out, actually jump out of the helicopter and, and get a hold of the net and kind of weigh the animal down and get her head down. And then basically once they got a hold of her legs, she was for the most part pretty easy to tip over. Yeah. Um, now these are cows only, correct? Yeah, we've, we targeted cows only be, because we were looking at um, that aspect of the population, um, which basically drives the population and puts cows on the ground. So cow only moose. Um, another part of that is if you, we, you could kept, capture bulls if we wanted to do that, cows are probably easier to catch with a helicopter because you don't have the antlers to contend with. Um, and bulls can, you know, be a little bit more bigger in size and the antlers can cause a problem of them actually hurting themselves too if they go down and hit an antler. Um, but yeah, the guys got the moose down. Um, as you probably see in the video, um, the first thing they try and do is get her blindfolded. They get a hold of her legs um, while avoiding getting kicked and would get her hobbled. Um, and primarily what we were looking at doing when we were handling those animals um, was first and foremost getting a GPS collar put on them. Um, so we could track their movements and then we were also drawing blood samples and then collecting fecal samples from them. Okay, for what? To, what kind of data were you looking for out of the, uh, the samples that you took? As far as the blood samples that we took, we were looking for uh, pregnancy rates of our adult cows. So we do a, a serum assay on that to test for pregnancy, um, which was really good for those 40 cows. Um, of those 40 cows, 38 of them um, came back as pregnant. And then as far as the fecal samples, we're just looking at the overall health. You can look at parasite loads um, of those animals to see if there's anything that may be affecting the health of that animal. If you're putting GPS collars on, I'm assuming that you're looking at ranges that they're in, if they're in their traditional habitats, if they're not. As far as the tracking of these animals, um, traditionally what most studies use is VHF collars, which mean you have to actively go back out and locate these animals. With this new technology, a lot of studies are using now with the GPS, you don't have to get in a plane and go out and look for them. That, that data, those collars act, actually are like a mini computer processor that takes a location. You can set it to how many locations you want it to take throughout the day. Our cows, um, those collars take a location every four hours and it stores it on board and then every three days those locations are uploaded to a satellite and then down into one of our servers so we can track their movements. But basically what we're looking at primarily, I guess, for those adult cows is uh, seasonal movements, how far are they moving, what their home ranges might be in the summer or winter home ranges. Um, and then those collars also have the ability to let us know if that animal stops moving. So looking at overall survival of those, those animals as well. Okay, you're doing this in collaboration with... Uh... Right, and this study is um, being done with um, the University of Mary and the principal investigator on it, working with myself, is Dr. Jim Maskey. Um, it was just a really good fit. Uh, Jim and myself have been friends for quite a few years, went to grad school at the University of North Dakota, and he had done prior work 
in North Dakota in the early 2000s looking at um, moose population ecology in the state. And most of his work was geared around the Lone Tree area and then in the Turtle Mountains. So it was a good fit for him to come on and, and work with us on the project. What are you finding out so far? Uh, so far, I guess, you know, from our samples that we collected in the field, we know we have really good pregnancy rates. Um, we're a year in now. Um, we have fairly good survival rates, I guess, for adult cows, which, you know, across their range. Um, North Dakota, we don't have large predators like other states or provinces would have. So, you know, it's not surprising that we have really good survival. Um, we had 20 cows collared on the Williston River bottoms. And of those 20, one ended up dying in May of this past year and we don't really know what the cause of mortality was. It was coincidental with um, or coincided with um, the calving period so it could have been something to do with that. Um, so we have still have 19 cows in the air on the river bottom. They're not really moving anywhere and in the Kenmere area we're probably seeing a little bit more movements just because their habitat is a little bit more interspersed with agriculture. Um, we had one cow that tore her collar off um, and lost it so she's out presumably roaming around unmarked now. And then we recently had one here oh, in November that had moved from the Sherwood area down to the J. Clark Sowley Refuge, you know, a movement of about 65 miles straight line. And it was really interesting to see if she would have returned to her winter range where we captured her, but unfortunately she ended up falling through the ice um, and drowning. So. So in, in the Kenmere area, we have 18 cows still in the air. This is all data then that Game and Fish can really put to good use. Right, so basically for North Dakota, um, we've been hunting moose in the state since 1977. And primarily those seasons were in the northeast part of the state in the Pembina Hills and the Turtle Mountains, which would be considered their traditional habitat in the state. You know, fairly heavily timbered areas and also along the Red River Valley corridor. But Moose numbers in those areas are fairly low. We know that from our winter surveys. But the interesting thing now is the northwest part of the state where we're conducting this study, moose numbers seem to be expanding or they're doing really well. Well, this would not be what would be normal for moose habitat in the state. So basically try and get some information. We have a lot of good information where we should have moose, but we no longer have moose there and trying to obtain better information where we have moose now you know, and do a good job of managing them there, you know, basically for the public of North Dakota. Sure, so basically the study shows you more about moose movements, moose populations, and how they got that way. And how they got that way and how they're surviving on the landscape. All right, Jason, thanks. You're welcome. You can apply for a moose license in what is called the Big Three Lottery, moose, elk, and bighorn sheep. It is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You still have some time to apply. The deadline for applications for the lottery is March 25th. For Jason Smith and the rest of the staff here at North Dakota Game and Fish, thanks for joining us for Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.